I'm a cancer physician. And when people learn about what I do, most look at me and say, how do you do that? I could never do what you do. It's very difficult to go to work every single day and look at a patient or a person in their eyes and say, the test came back and unfortunately, the cancer is spreading. It is very difficult when somebody comes to you and says, how many months do I have to live when you know it's only days? I see fear, I see hopelessness, I see tears every single day. But I also see joy, I also see strength, I see compassion, and I see people com coming together. How do I personally deal with it? Seeing all this fear and sadness every day can bring about a lot of grief. And how do doctors deal with grief? If we show compassion, if we show tears, we're not considered professional. As a resident, I started blogging. And this blog led to several incidences and forms of magic that I can't even explain. Blogging led to Facebook and Twitter. Sure, we share what we're eating, where we are, who we're hanging out with. But this form, these forms of social media became magic for me. About three years ago, I had a 30-year-old patient with end-stage breast cancer. When I asked her what she wanted, she said, you know, I'd love to go see The Ellen Show. I said, okay, let's get tickets. I went online to ellentv.com. They were out of tickets for that season. I even called the show, and they said, sorry, can't help you. I asked a few friends who work in the industry peripherally, and nobody could help me out. I put out the call on Twitter. Mind you, I had 200 followers at the time, not many. But the people that I did have follow me were amazing. One woman who I didn't even know said, you know, I'll see what I can do. And two weeks later, we had VIP tickets to that show. From that moment on, I knew this platform could transform the lives of some of my patients. I told my staff to listen to the patients to see if they had any dreams or wishes, and if we could, we're going to help them. Social media is more than a game. Right after I said these words, a nurse came to me and said, you know, a colleague's patient, a woman that I don't even know, well, she was mentioning to me that she would love to go see the Pittsburgh Steelers play. She's loved the team, she and her husband are big time fans, but they don't have the means to go. I looked at the nurse and I said, well, let's try to get her there. She said, how? I said, I don't know, but we're gonna try. That afternoon, I sent a call on Twitter to all the airlines who were on the, the, the medium and said, can, can anybody donate two tickets? And nobody responded. Later that week, I had to give a talk, and at the end of my talk, I said, you know, I have a patient and her husband who would love to see the Steelers play if anybody in the audience has frequent flyer miles, you know, connections to the Steelers or hotel rooms, just please find me on Twitter, I'd truly appreciate it. Right after I said these words, magic happened. A man stood up in front of the audience and said, I would like to donate my frequent flyer miles. Another man stood up, had $20, a $20 bill in his hand and brought it forth to me on stage and said, let's get her to Pittsburgh. And then 300 people in the audience opened their wallets and fives, tens, twenties started coming down. And I had a stack of cash this high. I was overwhelmed. The next day I received an email. Somebody from the audience said, I'd love to donate the hotel room. Another person said, can I donate the rental car? After getting permission, I had the woman on the phone and I said, hi, um, you don't know me, but I just wanted to know your dream. And she said, who are you? And her husband picked up the phone. He had just come back working the overnight shift at the railroad. He goes, who are you? I go, sir, you don't know me, but what's your favorite football team? He goes, the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I said these words, I said, you don't know me, but there are a lot of people in the world, including myself, who care about you. And we've put together a package for you and your wife to go see the Steelers play. They were overwhelmed. She started crying on the phone. Who are you? We met the following week, and a few months later, they made it to that game. They not only made it to the game, but Lynn Swan, the NFL Steeler Hall of Famer, came to the suite 
to hang out with her and her husband. After the game, she said, Dr. Tajura, how can I ever repay you? I said, you know, your hugs and your smiles, that's, that's more than enough. That's more than anybody could ever need. She said, she said these words after that. She said, I've been dealing with this cancer for, for about seven years. It's in every bone, it's in my lungs, it's in my brain. I deal with so much physical pain every single day. But these last three days that I've been in Pittsburgh, I've been without pain. My parents volunteer at a medical camp in Uganda every summer. One summer I had the opportunity to go. It's a very bare bones medical camp. You know, tents are put up, thousands of people wait to get the basic care. Hemoglobin's drawn, kids get their vitamins. You know, it's not a surgical ensuite, very bare bones medicine. The very first day of this two week medical camp, I saw this gentleman. What he has is called elephantitis. If it's caught early, it is curable. However, at this late stage in the game, the only sense of cure is an amputation. Just chop the, the leg off and you're good. Sounds simple, but not in Uganda, where we were. Hospital, the local hospital that was there did not even have one EKG machine. When I'm talking bare medicine, it's bare medicine. If you were in the hospital, family would have to bring you food and clothing. Family would have to bring you medications. It's not like you get to check a list of what you want to eat every day like you do here. I found out more about this gentleman. He was 27 years old. He used to have a wife and three kids, but they left him right after he this became that. And when I talked to him, he could not even look at you in the eye. His entire sense of self was gone. I took this photo and I put it on my blog. And immediately I got a response. Somebody said, well, I'd like to donate money. So we put it on Twitter and overnight, over $1,000 was raised from all around the world, from people I don't even know. People have asked me, why do they donate? They don't know you. And I say the fundamental thing is trust. They trusted me. I met him on Monday. On Tuesday morning, I met with the surgeon at that local hospital. I said, we will take it upon ourselves to bring him food and clothing and medication if you could please just amputate his leg. Tuesday afternoon, his leg was amputated. And every day at lunch, I would go and give him his food and clothing and medication. And although I didn't speak his language, smiles and hugs were language enough. And by the end of the two weeks, he was being fit for a prosthetic. But more than that, he started smiling. He started laughing. He started looking you in the eye. His sense of self came back again. The community from all around the world has helped. I have some incredible stories. I had a, a woman with end-stage disease, and I was radiating her pelvis. She had severe diarrhea, and I said, you know, you really need to watch your diet. Eat these types of foods, not these type, types of foods. And she looked at me with great sadness. She said, you know, my husband's out of a job. I'm obviously not working, so we have to go to a food bank for food. I don't get to pick and choose what I can eat. It broke my heart. This woman is in her last stage of life, and she can't even go through that comfortably. I put it out on my Facebook. I said, if anybody can, would like to donate a gift card to a grocery store, you know, there's a woman, a patient of mine that needs it, that would be, it would be a great help. Other friends put it on their Facebook feeds, et cetera, et cetera, and by the end of the week, I had $500 worth of gift cards. This helped this lady in her last weeks. One day I became really sad. A man was, came into my office alone. He was not doing well with his cancer. He had no loved ones or family. And I put it out my Twitter feed. I said, you know, it makes me very sad when people have to deal with cancer living alone without any of that support. A woman from upstate New York responded to my tweet and she said, you know, my kids and I would like to make him a get well card or the patient a get well card. Can you send me his age, their age range and their sex, and we want to, you know, make him a homemade card? 
A week later, I got this beautiful card with pictures, with notes, and ironically, that afternoon, that particular gentleman was placed in the ICU. So when I went to go see him, I had this card in my hand. It made him smile, and to see that smile was incredible. Another story I'd like to share is of the community coming together. I had this elderly lady come to me. She was a widow, she lived alone, was a little cantankerous, very ornery, and it was around Christmas time. So I asked her, you know, seeing you for a fall visit, how are you doing? And what are you gonna do for the holidays? She looked at me, she goes, nothing. I'm gonna be baking my own birthday cake. You know I was born on Christmas. It broke my heart. I said, you know, I'm not gonna be here for Christmas. I was gonna be out of the country, but what's your favorite flavor of cake? I'll come to your house about the week before and we'll celebrate together. I don't want you to celebrate your birthday alone. So we were talking about flavors of cake and what she liked, and then I just said, you know, what's your dream? Do you have any dreams or wishes? And she looked at me and she giggled like a little girl. She said, you know, I've always wanted a surprise birthday party, but being born on Christmas, you get screwed. <laughs> and I said, yeah. She goes, and then she said, well, I'm a little too old for birthday parties. I'm going to be 67. And I agreed with her. I said, sure, you're, you're a little too old for birthday parties. She left the office, and that, right after she left, I told my staff, we're going to throw her a surprise birthday party. My staff said, they rolled their eyes and said, how are you going to do it? I said, I don't know. We'll figure it out. I put that as my Facebook um, status. I said, the next patient dream is to throw a birthday party. A girl from Atlanta, a good friend of mine, said, well, I'd like to donate some money to offset the cost. I said, no, it's okay. She goes, no, I want to give. Then another friend of mine, who I hadn't seen since elementary school, responded. She goes, you know, I'm now a professional baker. Can I please offer the cake? What flavor and color scheme do you need? That Later that week, I was asked to speak at a local high school, and so I told the high school students, well, we're gonna be celebrating a patient's birthday. If anybody wants to come for pizza and ice cream, I'd love for you to be there. Some fellow doctors in the hospital found out about it. One doctor said, can I bring the balloons? One said, can I bring flowers? I asked uh, former patients to come and bring their kids, current patients to come. It's just a birthday party. It doesn't matter for who. You will find out at that party. And let me tell you, that afternoon at that local pizza parlor was magic. Over 25 high schoolers showed up. They made this huge banner for her. The cake was gorgeous. And as she walked into the door, she was screaming, this is the family I never had. This is the family I never had. She went to every single person and said, thank you so much for coming. The moment that stood out for me the most this afternoon was a high school student who was crying and she came to me and she said, Dr. Tajura, thank you so much. I go, no, thank you so much for coming and showing up. She said, you know, I did not know how much my presence meant to anyone until today. The world also listens. I had an elderly couple and the very first day I met them, the wife had to go through treatment. Her husband stopped me and said, please keep her alive until October, which was six months from then. He's followed that up with, it's gonna be our 62nd wedding anniversary then. I found out that they loved classical music and they followed a gentleman named Andre Ryu. He was going to come in concert later that year in December, so I asked her one day if she was gonna go attend the concert. And she looked at me, she said, no, we watch him on PBS, we can't afford tickets, so we're not gonna go. I bought them two tickets that afternoon, and on her very last day of treatment, I handed her the envelope, and I said, you know, I hope you enjoy the concert, happy early anniversary. That was June of that year. She was overwhelmed and really excited with the hopes of attending this concert six months from then. Unfortunately, a month after, the cancer had spread to the brain, and she was diagnosed as being terminal. That afternoon when I met her, I hugged her, and her very first words were, Will I be alive to attend that concert? And I looked at her and I said, I want you to stay positive and remove every single negative thought in your head. Envision you and your husband in those seats and you will be there. We started treatment and that, after, that evening I was running errands in a store and I came across an Andre Ryu CD. I picked it up and I got chills and I said, I need to buy this for her. 
so I could give it to her to listen, to kind of keep her going. That evening, I wrote a blog post entitled Music of the Heart. And I wrote the story, and I, in the end, my last paragraph was, I don't ask my readers for anything, but if you can please send this lady and her family love, compassion, strength, and courage to get her to December, I would truly appreciate it. I put it out on my Twitter feed, people started responding, and then a woman from the Netherlands said, did you know that Andre Ryu is on Twitter? I said, okay. She goes, why don't we all send it to him? And you know, he's famous, you know. I'm like, well, what are the odds that he's gonna read it? So people started sending him the link, and two weeks later, on July 3rd at 3.30 p.m., I got a direct message from Andre Ryu saying, dear, I would love to help your patient. A few days after that, I was on a conference call with his manager that said, we get hundreds of requests, we never respond. We read your blog post and are so touched, how can we help? They offered her and her husband VIP tickets to the December show with the opportunity to meet Andre afterwards. And her manager said, will she be alive in, will she be alive in December? And I said, you know, I don't know. She and her husband did make it to that concert. To see the love and the happiness during that concert and while meeting Andre was incredible. As her husband was wheelchairing her out after the concert, he hugged me and he said, thank you so much. This gave her the incentive to fight, looking forward to this concert. It not only kept her alive longer, but it kept me alive longer too. a painting done by my friend who I met on Twitter, and it's entitled The Healing Hand. We all have hands that heal. You don't need to wear a white coat to heal. We all have grief. We all have sorrow. For me, social media has been incredible to help change the lives of my patients, whether it make them smile, whether it get them better food for the day, whether it bring them a smile with a card, whether it just be a simple hug. Social media has been incredible for me. I want to know what it does for you. Thank you.